Hi, I'm John Monroe with the Lamar County Conservation District. Kogan grass is considered to be the seventh worst plant pest in the world, and Lamar County has probably become the first. And today we have three speakers from various backgrounds. They're all experts in their field, and they're going to share some information with us on uh, the problems associated with Kogan grass, uh, proper identification of the grass, and then uh, what we can do about uh, treating the grass. Historically, Kogon grass was introduced in the United States in 1911-1912 as a packing material for Satsuma oranges and came into Mobile Bay, Alabama. It was then used for a potential forage crop for livestock and they found out real quick that it is, has a very high silica content and there's no value there. It damages the mouth of the livestock. It has also been introduced or used for soil stabilization and soil reclamation and uh, as you can see it will pretty much hold the earth together. Here in this forested situation that I'm standing in, Kogon grass has detrimental effects to our, to our forest industry. You can see the amount of biomass that's around me, which is only about 40% of the Kogon grass plant, 60% is below the ground, but it burns at an extremely high temperature, up to 842 degrees Fahrenheit, up to five feet off the ground. So you can imagine when a fire comes through this, what kind of detrimental effect it's gonna to have to our forest resources. Kogon grass is extremely difficult to reestablish stands that has Kogon grass on the ground. When we go in and try to reforest the stand, we have got to eradicate the Kogon grass before we can successfully reestablish either longleaf or loblolly or slash, especially the longleaf. And when we're talking about natural regeneration or regeneration of any of our native species, there's so much biomass above the ground that the natural seed, the native seed, can literally not get down to the ground and they have to be able to, to germinate. And when we're trying to reestablish forest products, we've got to get rid of this up front before we can even think about having a successful stand down the road. Kogon grass is the earliest blooming grass that we have here in South Mississippi and it's going to start blooming here in the next few weeks. It will produce up to 3,000 seeds per plant. It can be wind borne for up to 15 miles. However, a lot of our spread occurs by our wildlife moving through these stands of Kogon grass during bloom. It's also spread by mowing equipment, vehicle equipment, tractors, logging operations. There's a whole host of ways that Kogon grass is spread across the south. The, yeah, the good thing is when we meet with landowners, the Kogan grass does have several identifiable traits to, to tell them and, and show them how to identify it. Yeah, uh, it's and one of the things that a uh, landowner has to be careful about is is uh, misidentifying Kogan grass and spraying a beneficial grass that could be uh, songbird food or something like that. Uh, generally speaking, most of our native grasses aren't going to form huge patches like this. So that's a good indication that, that this is Kogan grass just by the, the very nature of the size of the, of the patch. Uh, on a finer scale, though, when you start looking at Kogan grass, uh, there are some key features. Uh, the blade of the uh, of the grass, the midrib is generally going to be off-centered, and that's sort of a relative thing. Sometimes you can make yourself believe that something's off-centered that's that's really not if you're trying to force it into an identification. And certainly when it's just greening up as it is now, we're fairly early in the season. That feature isn't always uh, readily identifiable. You kind of have to. Uh, find several blades of grass and, and make a judgment over several rather than just trying to grab one piece. More, more is generally better. Um, the other identifying feature is uh, this time of year it's going to be sending up small shoots of new, uh, new leaves uh, and they're going to be very, very sharp. We often joke the easy way to identify is just to take your shoes off and run barefoot through it. Uh, don't do that. Uh, <laughs> but, uh, but you can see these very sharp shoots that are coming up. Another was when you dig a, a nice mass of rhizomes up um, later on in the season, in uh, April and May, it's going to start sending out some very sharp rhizomes that are, 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 are very prickly. Uh, they're sharp enough and stout enough that the plant can actually grow through the roots of other species. And then, of course, later on uh, in the season when it flowers, it's got a nice white, puffy, feathery type flower that uh, is, is fairly uh, indicative of that species. What about the color? Isn't it kind of a different shade of green, different shade of brown? 
uh, depending on if it's dormant or growing at the time? It is. It, it, it's a little bit, and again, that's sort of a relative term. A lot of times, you, relative color, you have to see that against other um, species to really make that decision, is it this or that. Uh, if you see it on the roadside, especially if you've got a nice open spot, those colors really contrast That's well right. from a distance. Um, Not to mention it seems like it's tear shaped in its growing pattern wherever you see it. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yep, nice. Certainly you can see that most of the other grasses that would be similar to this are going to be bunch grasses and so they're going to be clumps. Uh, whereas this forms a, a patch that's radiating out year after year. Okay, Doc, you were mentioning how the ne negative impact that Kogon grass has on our native species. Russ, how's that going to impact our native wildlife species? Absolutely a, a, a really detrimental effect because it displaces our native bunch grasses, uh, displaces a lot of our native seed producing plants. Um, so when you look at it from, a, like I say, a nesting aspect for turkeys or for quail, uh, turkeys, and they're just not going to nest in here. Quail certainly aren't going to nest in here. And then you look at it from a brood ecology standpoint, uh, when quail chicks or turkey chicks hit the ground, they're not going to be able to fight their way through this, stitch, uh, this thick thatch layer, so uh, really hard on them. From a deer forage standpoint, not a lot of native plant native plants going to come fight their way through this, so uh, you lose a lot of forage value. Uh, so. If you're looking at songbird habitat, uh, really not good songbird habitat. So from an overall wildlife standpoint, uh, from game species, uh, it's really bad. Uh, not to mention our threatened and endangered and non-game species as well. No, exactly. Gopher tortoise that lives in this part of the world, he, one, he cannot even navigate through this thick stuff. Sure. And one of the problems that, that happens, gopher tortoises will gravitate toward open areas. And when kogon grass infestations come in, the gopher's got to pick up and leave or, or, or starve to death. Sure. Now we've talked about all the negative uh, impacts on native plant communities and wildlife habitat and reforestation practices. If you're a private landowner really wanting to manage your property, you can't afford not to control this, can you? Oh, that's exactly right, Russ. If you're a private landowner, I hope you're going to take this one species very serious. Its uh, natural rate of spread is exponential. It occurs in 30 different countries. It's over a billion acres worldwide that's infested. Uh, just think about the natural spread here in Mississippi. It occurred here accidentally in the early 1900s. And then about 1979, there was approximately 19 counties that had documented infestations. And today, I would, I would say that if, if all 82 of our counties in Mississippi aren't infested, they will be shortly. Doc, if you're a private landowner wanting to manage this stuff and all the research has been done, is there anything uh, in the natural world, world out there that takes care of this or is it all going to be with, with herbicide? Or Yeah, there's, there aren't any natural uh, enemies to uh, Kogan grass in, in Mississippi. There aren't any herbivores that can eat the grass. Uh, there aren't any things that eat the seeds. Uh, there aren't any plants that can really compete with it. And so far, we haven't seen any insects or disease that affect it. So we're pretty much limited to herbicide treatments. Well, currently, in, in our forest industry and in our wildlife management, there's only a couple of herbicides that we use on a regular basis. And uh, we use glyphosate as one of the products. And we use it, you know, underneath these hardwood trees like you see behind us here. And if we're doing pine management, we like to use a mazapir. But outside of that, there's some stuff coming down the market. but you know, time will tell if it's going to control it or not. Some trade name for, for glyphosate would be Cornerstone or Roundup or Razor Pro. And what's the trade name for a Mazapir? Uh, you've got Arsenal, Arsenal AC, you've got Chopper, you've got generics such as Polaris. There's a whole host of products out there so on the market. A lot of, lot of potential uh, trade names out there to use. Oh, yeah. I'd like to thank our three speakers who have shared with us today. They're experts in their field, and uh, although they have their own careers, they are volunteers with the local Soil and Water Conservation District, and we appreciate their participation. We hope it's been informative and you've learned from it. And for further information on how to uh, identify and control the Kogan grass, you can contact the Extension Service, you can contact Natural Resources Conservation Service or the local Soil and Water Conservation District. And we hope this has been a help to you and uh, we appreciate the Mississippi Soil and Water Conservation Commission for their help in this project also.